but I'm still Tanya and I'm an alcoholic. Tanya. <laughs> I just wanted to say that it's hiking. Um, <laughs> get those things out of the way uh, so that maybe I could feel a little better. Uh, congratulations on the birthdays this month. Um, and the people that, that uh, have 21 days and um, all the days, you know, in between 24 hours and 36 years and beyond. And uh, welcome, Sydney. Good to see you. And uh, Bethany, really glad you're here. Um, man, I, uh, first of all, I want to say the last time I spoke here was like 2012. And... Um, I didn't get sober until like the last five minutes, so I'm really hoping that I get sober tonight. Um, <laughs> I mean, in my story, I was I started sober. Anyway, uh, I'm going to take this off because I'm also really hot a lot. Um, thank you so much. So yeah, I'm Tanya Carroll, and I am a real alcoholic. Hey, Tanya and Carol. Hi. Thanks to all my friends and everybody. Yay, it's so good to see some people I haven't seen in a long time. Um, I'm just really grateful. I have a lot of friends in this room. Uh, man, so cool to see you. Yeah. Anyway, I can see that a lot. Um, uh, yeah, I had zero friends when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. Not one person, including my kids, wanted anything to do with me when I walked through the doors. And um, I have a host of friends today in this program. I have people who actually show up for me, who want to spend time with me, who support me, who love me unconditionally. They know exactly who I am and they love me anyway. Um, he's one of them. Uh, it's nice to have a sober husband. Uh, that never happened before. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so my sobriety date is May 26, 2010. I have a sponsor who has a sponsor, and I work with other women in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because uh, there is not anything I could possibly do to ever repay the debt that I have here. Uh, the, the freedom that I've been given, the freedom of the bondage of self that I've been given here, and um, I believe it is absolutely my duty to pass on what's been freely given to me. And um, so I really try to do that. You know, I'm not always great at it, but I try it. <laughs> um, I, uh, I want to thank uh, Erica, who's not here, for asking me to speak. <laughs> she got out of it, but I didn't get out of it. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I, I adore Erica and everybody that's a part of this home group, and um, I'm really grateful to be able to share my story here, especially in Spokane. This is where I got sober. We moved to the Tri-Cities about a year ago, and um, it was really weird leaving here. Um, it was really hard to, you know, walk away from the place that gave me a life. Uh, so let's see, my first drink, I was probably um, eight or nine. I come from a long line of alcoholism, and uh, it's not their fault that I drink. And the last time I, I told my story here, it was their fault. And I believed absolutely with everything in me that the only reason I was alcoholic is because of uh, my parents, you know, because of neglect, abuse, you know, it was his fault, it was her fault, it was the job, the house, the car, the city, uh, none of it had anything to do with Tanya, and um, I walked in here selfish and self-centered to my core, and uh, that girl is still in there if I'm not spiritually fit, and today I'm, I'm uh, well, let me say this, uh, I uh, I slammed a door this morning in my house, and um, I have not done that uh, in sobriety, I don't think, uh, to my husband. There's no fighting in my house, there's no yelling, there's no name calling, there's no putting hands on each other. 
There's no going to get milk and not coming home for three months. There's no, uh, you know, there's just, we just don't do that in our home. We really do try to live the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in all our affairs. And um, I was uh, scared, nervous, in my head, in pain, didn't feel good, exhausted. Uh, and the toolbox wasn't where I thought it should be. And uh, I got pissed. I'm just gonna be honest, like I was really upset and it and it was literally had nothing to do with the toolbox, you know? It had everything to do with Tanya and Tanya not getting her way and things not being placed where Tanya would like them to be placed and um, Tanya not praying and meditating before she opened her mouth today, you know? And um, so I gotta take a minute and uh, reflect and uh you know got in a hot shower and called god you know into the picture a god that i did not believe in when i got here a god that they thankfully was not done with me um i did not have a higher power when i came into the rooms of alcoholics anonymous that was you know, I heard a guy share his story last night, and he said he just wasn't at the party. Like, there was no, you know, I just wasn't at the party. There was no talk of, you know, the only time I ever heard about God was, um, you know, get your effing shoes on, we're going to Christmas service, you know, or whatever. And uh, that, and then, you know, um, not behave that way the rest of the year, you know. Uh, or in front of people, I guess I should say. You know, you put put a you look good on, and you go out and, and pretend like you have a perfect family, and then you come home and, and treat people like crap. And um, I, you know, I can say today that I have an amazing relationship with my parents. I just want to get that out of the way. I'm house sitting and dog sitting for my mom next week, and and she just took us on a trip to Yellowstone, and um, it took me about seven years in the program, working steps, to be able to spend a Christmas dinner with my parents without having to go to a meeting first, spend 30 minutes with them, and go to an alcathon immediately following. <laughs> you know, it was like, I shake, you know, just having to spend time. Um, because, you know, they're untreated. But the, the great thing is, is that the better I got, the better they got. You know, and the more I was able to see them for who they are and, and realize they absolutely did the best they could with what they had, and they were very sick just like me. And I, I tried everything in my power to not be an alcoholic, stay at the bar every day, don't show up for your kids, um, you know, and that's exactly what I was. I, I was exactly like that. And um, so, Anyway, I, I have a God today. I called him into the party today, you know, called him to the party, and I immediately was granted relief. I immediately was granted peace of mind. I immediately was granted, you go apologize to your husband right now. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's what happens for me, is I, I hear what I need to hear when I'm supposed to hear it, when I pause, long enough to listen. I have to pause long enough to hear the message, you know? And so I got to go downstairs and make an amends and think, you know, thank God we both work a program, we're autonomous, we work separate programs, we usually go to different meetings, we don't hold hands in meetings, we don't, you know, um, you know, we, we have sponsors, we call sponsors, we don't bring stuff into our home and uh, that, that is because of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, you guys gave me a relationship with you, you gave me a relationship with a higher power, you gave me a relationship with a partner, um, and, and I'm an abuser, you know? I put my hands on people. Uh, I was a fighter from the time I was very young. I would cause fights, I would beat people up, I would, um, just provoke, instigate, push, shove, push buttons, you know, um, and it's just because I was hurting and afraid, you know, and I was never going to admit that I was hurting and afraid. There was no way. 
And so I wasn't going to come here and admit that I was weak and that I needed some higher power, you know, like I just thought it was ridiculous. I thought there's no, okay, <laughs> how nice for you that you can pray and go, you know, um, but that wasn't going to work for me. I also didn't think that the 12 steps were going to work for me. I thought, you didn't drink like I did. If you can do some steps off a wall, it'd be better. Like, um, so my, my story is that, um, you know, I started drinking really young. Um, I, I started giving, like, my little brother uh, at three years old, you know, giving him Jack Daniels and, and seeing, you know, what kind of chaos he would cause in our house. I thought it was funny. Um, I, uh, I was very lonely, I was very sad, and I had a best friend who was the exact same way, and we did everything together from the time we were four and five years old um, until I got here. Well, the last year of my drinking, I had a restraining order on her, but <laughs> if that tells you anything about where I got the last, um, yeah, so anyway, my first treatment center, I was 15. Um, they, they took us to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous when I was in that treatment center. Um, I had been drinking alcoholically for about four years, and they told me I was a late-stage chronic alcoholic and that I was going to die. And uh, they put me in a straitjacket. I peed myself. I, I was so desperate to drink, they would not allow me to be with my, old, my own hands. Um, I, I thought I was crazy. You know, I really did my whole life. I just thought, why would anybody behave like this? Like, I knew every day when I woke up, I don't want to be this way. Why can't I stop behaving this way? I never associated it, I don't think, with alcohol, you know? Um, it's just crazy to me. Um, and so, anyway, thankfully, uh, you know, when it was time for me to come here, I moved to Spokane in 2009 to get clean off meth. Uh, drugs are a part of my story, and they were also a part of Bill and Bob's, if you haven't read the book. Um, and so I just, uh, you know, it's, it, I'm not going to be ashamed of that. That's, that's who I am. That's what I did. And um, I thank God that, that I did those things because I think they brought me down to get sober from alcohol quicker than alcohol ever would have. Um, I mean, alcohol brought me to my knees on a daily basis, but I didn't know it was alcohol that was doing it. I thought it was my behavior. I thought it was the way I thought. I thought it was, you know, I just, I never had peace of mind. My mind was always going. Um, and, and today I know that, you know, I get peace of mind directly proportionate to the peace of mind that I bring into the lives of others. Um, that's a very real thing that's in the book. And I um, also love the stories in the back of the book. I think they put them there for, for a reason, you know, that um, we can give this book to somebody in the middle of nowhere and they can feel like they've had a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. Uh, they're just extra long shares. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so uh, 15, anyway, 17, by the time I was 17, you know, at 15, I had absolutely zero intentions of getting sober. I did go into, um, I mean, I'll never forget my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous into Acoma, or Parkland, I guess, on Pack Avenue, and, um, you know, smoke-filled room, bunch of old men, I'm 15, I don't belong here, um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, but I'll never forget the steps being read for the first time. I, every time I hear the steps, I think about that meeting. And um, so anyway, I proceeded to, you know, uh, take hostages, destroy the lives of people around me. Um, I, I mean, I would do like really good in school. I was a straight A student, honor roll. And then I would like skip school, wreck a truck, beat up somebody, put them in the hospital. Um, you know, and then want to show up at school the next day, and they didn't really want me there. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I quit school my senior year. Um, I, I, like, kind of had it made for myself, but I ended up getting pregnant at 17. And, um, you know, I always, like, hit these, 
lows and then I would dust myself off and I would kind of be able to maintain enough to like, you know, hold a job, go to work, do whatever I needed to do and not like lose everything, you know? And so, you know, the bottoms, the number of bottoms that I hit drinking and using is just like unbelievable to me. And um, anyway, so I had a baby girl and um, at 17 and at 19, I got my first felony, my only felony. And uh, I, uh, I proceeded to, to drag two daughters through some pretty terrifying things. Um, I didn't get sober until they were 14 and 19. And so, uh, you know, I really tried to show up for them and I, and I couldn't, you know, I, I, I've worked since I was, well, at that time I had worked since I was 14, you know, from 14 to, uh, 39 or something, you know, I worked almost every day in my life and I was a really hard worker and I know I got that from my parents and uh, so I tried to give them everything, you know, we had a nice house and a nice car and, um, and then, uh, you know, I just wouldn't come home. I, I wanted to go pick my kids up from daycare and I couldn't. I just couldn't. My car just wouldn't go there, you know. Um, I was ashamed. I couldn't look them in the eye. Uh, I would I would be in the bathroom, you know, for hours uh, drinking in the bathtub and doing whatever. And um, just a minute, just a minute, you know. Um, so their sense of time is really off for one thing because they think a minute's like five hours. But um, no, we have an amazing relationship today because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been able to make amends to them a couple of different times. I'm actually on my amends again um, uh, because stone cold sober uh, without a God and steps for about 18 months. I almost destroyed my family last year and my daughter's wedding um, because I didn't pray and meditate like I did this morning. You know, a couple of a couple of days turns into a couple of weeks, and then Tanya is without a solution. So what happened for me after dragging those kids through? You know, I, I'd go from volleyball coach, you know, soccer mom, uh, softball team, you know, coach or whatever, uh, dance team mom, you know, all the things to like. I just couldn't show up. You know, we'd be in the same room and I'd be miles apart thinking about myself because that's what I did. I thought about myself, who was affecting me, what they were doing to me, who I could blame, what I, you know, I was just a total victim when I came here. It, it was everybody else's fault but mine, you know? And um, anyway, by the time I got here, I could, you know, go on and on about that, but I really want to talk about what sobriety has done for me. Um, so I, I mean, I guess I just real quick as to what happened, um, you know, I drink and drive every time I pick up a drink, I get in the car. That's just what I do. I drink and drove with your kids. I drink and drove with my kids every day for 30 years and, or however, you know, 19 years. And, um, I, uh. So I had borrowed some money from my sister. I was gonna come go to treatment in Spokane here and live with my parents in their basement at 37 years old. And um, my daughter had just graduated high school and I was able to make it uh, to her high school graduation, but I was drinking in the parking lot and I um, ended up sleeping with my other daughter's dad uh, while the kids were in the room. I was in a complete blackout. I mean, it was just pretty gross and um, that's kind of like what my drinking looked like their whole life, you know? And, and I was going to check myself in a Western State Hospital. I thought, something is wrong with me. And I never associated with alcohol. I could go, it was the drugs, I'm pretty sure it's the meth. I'm pretty sure it's the LSD. I'm pretty sure it's the, you know, but I never, I mean, alcohol was my first love. It was the first thing I ever loved. I grieved 
giving up drinking, like it was a partner, you know, it was the only thing that was ever there for me. It was the only thing that ever showed up for me. Um, and it also caused every bit of wreckage my life had ever seen, my kids' lives had ever seen, my family's lives had ever seen, you know, it was, it was alcohol that did that. And um, so I've learned that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has very little to do with alcohol and a lot more to do with my thinking. And I'm grateful to know today that I have the disease of alcoholism. You know, I have an obsession of the mind and I have an allergy to body. And when I put alcohol into my system, I develop the phenomenon of craving and I have to have more. I have to, I can't not, not drink. You know, I lost the power of choice. I drank against my will. Um, I, I could not drink. I couldn't just put the plug in the jug. I couldn't, you know, um, and I don't know. I, I, uh, one of the most misquoted lines in our book is, you know, people say no human power, no human power. Well, probably no human power is what our book says. And, um, you know, this is a power greater than me that could help me solve my problem. I need you guys to help me solve my problem. And this is my problem. Tanya is the problem. Alcohol is no longer the problem. You know, once I took alcohol out of the picture, I, I thought I was going to be great, you know? Uh, but what really happened is I still behaved poorly and now I had no excuse. I couldn't say I was drunk. I couldn't say I was, you know, it was like, no, you were stone cold sober when you did that. And uh, trust me, I've done some things in AA that I wish I could take back. Um, I've hurt some people here, you know, I've, I've hurt some people and some of them I haven't seen again. And, and I don't, I know I don't have the power to get people loaded and I know I don't have the power to get people sober. Uh, but I do know that my behavior affects the lives of people around me. Um, and my good behavior also affects the lives of people around me. You know, whatever it is I'm doing today, there is a ripple effect. Whatever that looks like, you know, whether it's good or bad. I, I get to choose that today because I have a sober mind. Um, and I didn't get to choose that before, you know. I was going to behave badly no matter what. I think I set out to try to kill myself for many years, and I never succeeded. And I, I just, I didn't want to be here anymore, you know? And uh, so anyway, I, I did want my kids. I love my babies, you know? My daughters mean the world to me. And so I was going to try to go to treatment or something, but I, I could not get sober in Tacoma. My mom was really impressed with people who can. Um, <laughs> I hear it all the time. I'm like, really? Tacoma? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I could not. And uh, so I went to borrow some money from my sister, and uh, I had one drink. And uh, so I drank my Tai with my sister and I got in the car and I was trying not to, uh, to get high. And so I uh, did some canned air. <laughs> Anybody, anybody's ever done that? It's a pretty good time. Uh, if you wanna shit yourself and black out. <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I normally don't talk about it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I, I blacked out, uh, did a 360 in my car on the freeway in Fife, hit a lady, pulled over, made sure she was okay, got back in my car and proceeded to try to go back to Puyallup, to the dope house where I was staying. Um, my little daughter I had sent to live with her abusive father in Southern California because it was safer than being with me. Um, my oldest wanted nothing to do with me, and as I was turning the corner, um, I was speeding like two miles over the speed limit, and anyway, uh, got pulled over. He gave me a breathalyzer, only time I've ever had one drink in my entire life. I passed the breathalyzer, I go to get in my car, he comes back, says his car was just in a high-speed chase. 
Um, there were uh, helicopters and, you know, that's what happens when Tanya has one drink. Like, uh, I'm in high speed chases, I don't know I'm in. And, um, so, uh, once again, I'm let go. I, I begged, I pleaded, I cried, and I said I'm sober uh, tonight. I'm sober, but I'm going to die if you if you take me away right now to Pierce County Jail. I don't think I'm going to make it. And he let me go. And that happened a hundred times. I mean, I cannot count the amount of times where I said, I'm loaded, take me. You know, and they're like, we're going to drive you back to the house you were just at. You know, or... Yeah. So anyway, the next day I came to live in my parents' basement. I drank harder than ever. I was drinking with them now. And, um, you know, it's like I was trying not to use. I thought that was the problem. What really happened was that I got, you know, had had enough of that that it made alcohol bring me to my knees. And finally, I was able to see that alcohol was a problem, you know. And uh, so I got a DUI leaving Bolos. Um, they say I ran a stop sign. Uh, I, I had a purse full of weighed up cocaine. Um, I probably had, I don't know, 12 or 14 shots in about a half hour. And uh, I was celebrating, you know. I got a big sale that day at my job and um, so I'm a good bullshitter. Find a lot of SAR. Um, and, uh, and he didn't check my purse and I already had a felony for cocaine and distribution and, uh, I'd be in prison right now. That guy should be in prison. Um, anyway, as soon as I got that DUI, you would think I would go, you know, wow, maybe it's time to quit, you know, but no, I thought maybe it's time to not drive to the bar anymore. I need to start taking an Uber, right, you know. Uh, it, they say that's how you can tell an alcoholic, you know, two people sitting in jail both just got busted for a DUI and one says, man, I'm going to stop drinking, that's crazy, I don't ever want to land in jail again, you know, and the other one says, I should have taken the back way. <laughs> That, that was my thinking, you know, and I remember the, uh, that Labor Day weekend, uh, I had embarrassed my kids. My kids came back after about three months of me being clean, um, not sober, but clean, and uh, I tore the tent down on them. I drank everything in sight. I think I slept with everything in sight. I was skinny dipping. I did all this stuff. And, and, you know, I remember sitting at this place by Spirit Lake. We were at the stoplight. I was so sick that morning. And uh, it was like 100 degrees. And it was just like, ugh, you know, just ugh. And uh, my daughter said, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to leave again. And. Uh, I was like, I'll think about it. I mean, the, the insanity of my disease and the way that it wants to hang on and run my life into the ground is pretty phenomenal to me. And my willpower worked on a lot of things in my life. I could dust myself off. I could go get a, right now, having not worked for a few years, I bet you I could go get an executive position in a downtown Seattle office making a ton of money because I'm a good bullshitter. But I would quickly lose that job to alcohol. You know? I mean, I just, I, I could will myself into anything but I could not overcome drinking on my own power alone. And I knew I needed help. And so I knew I needed to go back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I started going to meetings. I went to, um, I said I wasn't gonna talk that long about that. Anyway, um, I went to, uh, I went to a meeting, I went and got an evaluation, I lied through my teeth, um, I should have gone to inpatient treatment, and they sent me to a six month relapse prevention program, and uh, I had forgotten about a couple of treatment centers, I had forgotten the treatment center when I was 15, 
Um, I thought it was a really cool group of people. I went to this treatment center, it's no longer there, Harmony Grove. Um, and I, I have a really good friend from there still and uh, lost a couple of really good friends from there. And, um, you know, a big part of my story, I guess, is that I just was never really present for anybody. Um, when my brother was 16, uh, he got in a rollover car accident and they called me at like 11 o'clock at night, maybe it was six o'clock or something. It was like pretty early on a Saturday. But when they called, I was doing cocaine off a toilet seat in Puyallup in the, at the K restaurant. I'd been drinking since like 8 a.m. and I could not go be there and my brother was gonna die. And today, anybody can call me any time, night or day. And I can show up. My kids could call from Southern California and I could drive there right now and be with them. And one of the things that Alcoholics Anonymous afforded me to do is hold my brother's hand as he took his last breath three years ago. And I got to make amends for not showing up for him, for giving him drugs when he was young, for giving him booze, you know. So anyway, when I came to this program, I feel very fortunate that I met an entire group of amazing people. I mean, giants in the program to me. Angie Johnstone, who's no longer here with us. She was the treatment chair and she was an I don't need a meeting uh, member. And I wanted to be like her. Like I'd never seen anybody so beautiful and poised and funny. And you know, she was hilarious and uh, honest and caring. She was just such a compassionate person. And um, so I followed her around like a puppy, you know. Um, I, uh, so she was the treatment chair, so she started taking me to treatment centers with her. So we started going to Daybreak, uh, we started going to, um, Pioneer Center East for like the first four years of my sobriety. I took a meeting to Pioneer Center East every Saturday morning, um, whether I wanted to or not, because I made that commitment. There's lots of people in here who went to that meeting with me, um, with us. Lots of us went, and uh, when I was sitting at daybreak uh, talking to a bunch of 15-year-old girls, I remembered having been to treatment at 15. You know, my higher power revealed that to me, and I had forgotten so many things, you know. Um, I also uh, was blessed with an opportunity, uh, some of you know Bob and Joan, Bob, <laughs> Uh, was the first person with Ernie, who's no longer here with us, uh, to take me to Washington State Penitentiary, to one of the workshops they had down there. And, um, and I was hooked. From the moment I walked in, I was hooked. And I've been going ever since. So for, you know, 13 um, or 12 years, uh, we've been taking a meeting into Washington State Penitentiary, except COVID. Um, but those guys have given me a reason to show up. They, they've taught me accountability. They've, um, they, they've had better sobriety than I've had, you know. Uh, they're really, truly free on the inside, you know. And I know that I'm supposed to be in prison. I absolutely know that. And I know that I can also be in prison out here on the outside in my own head without the spiritual tools that have been laid at my feet. And so I wrote out a first step a good friend, Rachel, who couldn't be here tonight, um, she had me write out my first step. She said, the book says we look back through our lives, and, um, and I was able to see the powerlessness and the unmanageability of my drinking and my thinking without alcohol. You know, I came here, I didn't do any steps for nine months. I did a lot of service, um, service I've done since I've been sober. There's not been a break in that, but there was a break in the steps, and that almost cost me my life and my sobriety, and um, uh, I didn't really have a higher power, like I said, so I kind of skipped over two and three, and uh, went straight on to the fourth step. At nine months, I thought I was gonna die, and thank God a woman in the program said, Tanya, if you don't do some step work, you're gonna die. 
And somebody else did that for me a year ago. Let me save my life. I started writing that four step, and I hadn't slept in 30 years. I mean, I couldn't sleep. My brain was constantly going. You know, I was so sick. I didn't feel good. I was pissed at the world. I was a victim. I was all these things, you know? And none of it had to do with me, and none of it was my fault. And I sat there on a Saturday for five hours with a woman, April, what's her name, is her name. And, uh, and I shared every intimate detail of my life and the things, the ways I had harmed people. You know, we resolutely look at our own mistakes. I, it's not having a part to me, because when I say I have a part, it assumes that you have a part also. And so uh, I, I resolutely look at my own mistakes. I put out of my mind the wrongdoing of others. I, uh, I look for my faults. You know, where was I at fault in all of these things? And I found Tanya a lot. Heavy, big time, all over. <laughs> And um, and so I was able to share that, you know, and I went home and I put took the book, well, the book was in my hand, it wasn't up on a shelf, but um, I, I, I looked at, you know, read six and seven out of the big book, and, uh, and I went to bed that night, and I slept for like 14 hours, and I woke up the next day, and I have never been the same. I have setbacks. <laughs> but I have never been the same since that first four step, fifth step, you know. Um, I immediately made a list. I immediately started writing my amends. I did not want to make amends to my parents. I thought there's no way in hell. I don't care. <laughs> I really struggled seeing where I had been at fault in that one area. Um, it was pretty clear everywhere else, and, and I, I started praying about it, and it was revealed to me sleepless nights I caused my parents, the worry, the, the wrecking cars, the making them care for my kids when I was out, you know, doing whatever the hell I wanted to do, um, just, you know, hours and hours of lost sleep, lost money, lost time, lost hope. Um, and I made amends to my parents, and they've never been the same. I struggle at the 10th step, so I end up writing a lot of four steps. <laughs> uh, I've been through the steps. This is uh, 13 years sober. This is my eighth time going through the steps with my current sponsor. And uh, so last year, I, oh, I need to talk about 11 and 12. Um, we should have talked about that for 20 minutes. Um, I had a spiritual awakening as the direct result of doing the steps. The direct result, exactly as it's outlined in the big book. And um, I knew right then and there that it was my duty, my honor, my privilege to pass this on to other women. And uh, you know, praying and meditating every morning has mostly always been a part of my story. You know, I would get up and read the daily reflections or the uh, non-AA approved 24 hours a day, um, <laughs> uh, but very popular in AA. Um, and, and, and that would give me something to focus on, you know? I would have something, instead of rocketing, you know, into the fourth dimension of Tanya's existence, in constant collision with everything and everyone, I would like be able to think, to pray, to reflect, to have a topic in my mind that I would go through the day and like, you know, um, contemplate, you know, faithful contemplation. That's what this is about, right? And um, because of that, I think that's when I was really called to sponsor other women. And I think I was about a year and a half sober and I had my first sponsee, um, Aaron and I was really terrible at it. <laughs> you know, um, I come from kind of hard sponsorship. You know, we care more about your life than we do your feelings. And uh, that's how I sponsored. You know, you're here on time or I'm not your sponsor anymore. 
I mean, that's just the way that it was. And um, that, that kind of uh, loss of uh, spiritual principles that I had for about a year um, caused me to drop all my sponsees. I didn't know what I was doing anymore. I thought I was terrible. I'm unfit for service. Um, and, you know, thankfully, I got this beautiful sponsor who just is so thoughtful and kind and, and caring and uh, into the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and into the steps and brought me back to the third step brought me back to the first step, you know, brought me back to the fundamentals of this program that gave me a life to begin with. And, um, and I realized that I am supposed to be doing this, you know, and, and sponsoring other women. has been absolutely the greatest joy that I've ever had. I mean, it's like right up there with me and mom. I mean, these women have taught me how to be a friend, how to show up for each other, how to be accountable, how to be a mom, you know? I didn't have any tools when I got here, and you guys taught me everything. You know, going through the book with another woman, they say, if you want to learn something, teach it. You know, and they're teaching me. We're going through the book together. You know, I'm reading every day with a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous. Every day I read with another woman out of the big book. You know, out of the 12 and 12. And uh, it's the only thing that keeps me out of self. You know, when my phone's ringing all day, there's very little time to think about me. Very little time to think about Tanya, and that's exactly where I want to be, you know? And then I have a partner, you know, I got to have a big sober wedding. Um, you know, 250 of our closest friends at Fort Sherman <laughs> Chapel, you know? I had zero friends when I got here, you guys. Not one person could rely on me, could call on me, could show up for me. Nobody wanted anything to do with me, and I thought I was going to die that way. And you guys showed up for us, you know? You did the flowers, you hung the signs. Um, the amount of people that have shown up for me through 14 surgeries in however many years, you know, I always wake up from a hospital bed with, uh, you know, a room full of alcoholics, people carrying the message to me, coming into my home when I don't even know them, showing up for me. Doing that service, you know, the way that we carry the message to each other in here, the way that we show up in disaster, you know, the way that, you know, alcoholism is the great equalizer, right? It doesn't matter that I'm a felon or a stay-at-home mom or whatever. Like, when we walk through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, we are equal, you know, and we all have a place here. Whether it's raffle tickets or sharing in a meeting or setting up chairs or making coffee, like we come together, you know? It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It's the most beautiful place I've ever been. And I just want to read one thing. Oh, I need to say real quick that our daughters who called on the way here work together in a treatment center which is absolutely crazy to me. I said, why would you want to do that? Isn't that traumatic for you? Like, um, they've resuscitated people. They've uh, been assaulted. They've been in shootings. They've been uh, on the front lines, and they love it. And they say they're specially equipped. And they also know what alcoholics are not have done for their mom. And so they give out my number. They give out big books. They tell people where the meeting is. And I just want to say that I've had more fun, regardless of how I look right now. <laughs> I have not been bored one day in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
I've gone to more concerts, clean and sober, to weddings, to karaoke, to bowling, to volleyball, to potlucks, to I've ate my weight in potlucks, including today. Uh, the alcathons, the dances, the, you know, if, if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, I really highly recommend that you get involved in service, that you get involved with a group of people that's doing fun stuff, that you make sober <laughs> friends here, you know, that you get a sponsor, that you work these 12 steps. Because this is a sufficient substitute, you know? I didn't think there would ever be anything like alcohol for me. And you guys proved me wrong. So I just want to read. Out of working with others. I have written here, I get a good buzz from working with others. <laughs> Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ugh. practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our twelfth suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. Exclamation point. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. Not bad. Just <laughs> life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it frequent contact with each other, with newcomers and with each other, is the bright spot of our lives. And you guys are definitely the bright spot of my life. Thank you for letting me share.